Welcome to the Arrive Podcast, the U.S. Immigration Law Podcast for Canadians. I'm your host, Jeremy Richards, along with fellow U.S. immigration lawyer, Christine Jerusik. Today we will be discussing what happens after you file your case with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the I-130 petition for a spouse through adjustment, which means that you're the foreign spouses inside the United States, they entered at some point in time legally to the United States, and now they're requesting a green card through marriage to a U.S. citizen. So once you file your case with USCIS, the first step is, is a step that people, I think, overlook, and that is when you send these cases, they typically go to a lockbox. What is a lockbox? It's like a P.O. box. They pick up the mail. The mailroom will take it and they will sort through the petitions that have been mailed and they will do checks on those petitions before they forward it on for for further processing. And what are they looking for at the lockbox? They're making sure that the application was filed properly, that there aren't any obvious deficiencies with the case when it's filed, meaning are all the forms properly signed? Are they dated? Are the forms completed? Are the boxes checked? Do the forms have the accompanying filing fees? Um, are those filing fees in the proper amount? Are those checks signed and dated? Things like that, that they're gonna verify that the case is properly filed. If the case was not properly filed because it had a wrong filing fee, a signature is missing, uh, or something else is deficient with the case, they will reject the case and they will send it back to you. And when a case is rejected, it doesn't come back quickly. First of all, it doesn't get receded in quickly at lockbox. It can take a few weeks for them to, to recede it and do their checks and then notify you. If it's rejected, they'll send everything back and it could take a month to two months, if not more, to get that case back after rejection. So it's important that when you file that case, that it is done properly, that it has the minimum requirements to be receded in by USCIS, or it won't even make it past the lockbox. It'll get kicked out of the mailroom. Right, and we should note that um, there are certain types of cases that can be filed with USCIS electronically, but this is not one of them. So um, the evidence must be submitted on paper to USCIS as well as the forms, and all, everything needs to be properly signed, and all the boxes need to be checked correctly, or else you could get a rejection. And USCIS doesn't require originals as far as the evidence goes. People ask that all the time. So you're submitting copies of the evidence with these applications. Um, so that's the first check. Is it going to pass the mailroom? Hopefully it does. If it gets past the mailroom, then it will be received for processing by USCIS. Once USCIS receives the case for processing, they will issue official receipt notices that will identify that will provide a case number that you can you can track your case with. And they'll also cash your checks. So before you get those receipt notices in the mail, you, if you paid by check, you can verify uh, on your bank account and see, oh, that check cleared. Well, that means that USCIS has received your case and they're gonna start processing it. So you receive a receipt number for everything that you filed with USCIS. So that's a lot of mail in these cases. USCIS loves to kill trees. Uh, they will issue a receipt notice for the I-130 petition. They'll issue a receipt notice for that adjustment application as well. If you file for work authorization, you'll receive a receipt notice for that. If you filed for travel authorization, you'll receive another receipt notice for that. So you could be receiving four receipt notices in response to your filing from USCIS. You won't you won't get a receipt notice though for your financial form. So the affidavit of support won't get a separate receipt notice because that's tied to the adjustment. Correct, yeah, good point. You don't get a receipt notice for, the, that's called the I-864 affidavit of support. Or if you submitted your medical, they don't do a receipt notice for that medical form either. Right. Um, so just for the I-130 petition, the adjustment, the work authorization and travel authorization. And then when you have that receipt notice, you can create a USCIS account through their website to track your case directly through the website. And it's actually pretty convenient. You put in all your case numbers, you provide a cell phone number or an email address, and they'll send you updates uh, when they have them. Those updates are often few and far between, uh, but they will send you a text update or an email update as they process your case. 
Uh, so it's a good way to track your case is entering that in. You can also go directly to the website with your receipt numbers and you can go to uh, case status and put in your receipt number if you want to do it that way to track the progress of your case as well. After your case is properly received with USCIS, then the next thing that will happen is typically the biometrics appointment. And biometrics appointment may be waived in some cases depending on how you entered the, the country. But typically that's the next step is your biometrics. So they'll notify you of your biometrics appointment date or they'll notify you that your biometrics have been waived. Uh, timing on biometrics is <laughs> crazy right now. Uh, you know, in a, a normal era before COVID, you would get your biometrics usually within 30 days after your case is received. Now, who knows? Well, they're uh, probably limiting those appointments because of COVID, not cramming so many people into the schedule. Um, that's where a lot of the waivers is. Of yeah. And if you don't know what are. biometrics is, that's where you give um, your identity information. So your fingerprints and photo to USCIS so that they can run their background checks on you and figure out who you are and if you are who you say you are. And it's a very simple appointment. You just show up at the date and time that they give you. You bring your identification documents. There's no interview. You don't have to bring if you don't have to bring your spouse with you. You show up, go through security, they'll do your fingerprints, your photograph, and you're on your way. It's that simple. So it's not something to stress about, but it's something you have to go to. If you miss your biometrics appointment, then they will deny your case. You can reschedule or request to reschedule of a biometrics appointment. If you do that, it's it, it will just only it'll cause further delays in your case if you do it. We don't right. suggest missing that. And if, you, yeah, and you can't reschedule it for a date and time that's convenient for you. You can just ask them to reschedule it, and they will randomly pick a date and time to, and send you a new notice. That's a good point. People say, oh, I can't make it at that day and time. Can I have this date? No, you can't. Uh, that's <laughs> not how it works. They will randomly give you a new date that could be even more inconvenient than the first date you got. So you, you can request, you know, so if you're, I've had a case where someone couldn't make their biometrics because they were expecting a child. So if you give an explanation like that and say, listen, I can't come in May because I'm going to have a baby. I can come in June. They'll usually push you to June then, but you can't say I, I can come June 5th and, and expect that that's the date you'll get. Exactly. So in most cases, you're going to want to show up when they give you that um, because you have to do it. It has to be completed. After you've completed your biometrics, your case will continue to process with USCIS. And at this point, it'll be assigned to a USCIS location for processing. And when they're processing your case, they, if they see any further deficiencies, they could issue what's called a request for evidence. They could even, at this point, issue what another request, which is called a notice of intent to deny if it's very deficient or they see obvious reasons for denial, or they could outright deny your case at that point. So they'll be reviewing your case. They'll be reviewing the evidence and issuing further requests at this point if they have them. Uh, and a request for evidence, if you don't know what that is, it, it's... It is what it sounds like. USCIS, maybe maybe you submitted uh, for a Canadian. Here's a perfect example. Canadians have two different birth certificates. They have a, a card that every Canadian gets, right? The, well, the that's, little wallet size. Yeah, that's limited to Ontario. So every province gets a different certificate. But in Ontario, they typically give you like a wallet card. Which isn't sufficient for a birth certificate. They want to see your long form. It has to list your parents or your place that you've been, that you were born. All of those details have to be present on that birth certificate. So that's something they could request as as a part of a request for evidence. Maybe you didn't submit sufficient financial documents in support of your affidavit of support. So they want your most recent tax return or they want pay statements. A common one is um, you haven't submitted enough um, information about your relationship too. They like to see a lot of, uh, you know, those joint finances and evidence that you are in a bona fide marriage. So if you are deficient in that area, they won't be able to approve it. And they'll ask you for additional information there, too. Yes, that's probably, yeah, that's one of the most common ones. And that one I get some laughs at sometimes because some people will say, well, I submitted my marriage certificate. What else do I need to submit? We're married. Isn't that enough? Uh, no, that's not. 
It shows you're legally married. It doesn't show that you are in what Christine referred to as a bona fide relationship. In other words, do you actually live in a marital union? Are you in this marriage out of love and not for immigration benefits? Right. This is this is really the first review that they're doing, looking for marriage fraud to see if you're actually in a real relationship. And if, if they can't see that on the face of the documents you provide, um, there could be a problem with your case. So it's best to submit as much evidence as you can to show that's true. And this and that'll be your first opportunity to overcome any doubts that USCIS might have in your case. So those are requests for evidence, notice of intent to deny. Those are very important to respond to in a timely manner too. If yeah, you and, we, and we should note they come they come by snail mail. So yes. don't expect to get an email or a text notification that there's something wrong with your case. Um, and even those notices that you signed up for, you may not receive an, a notification. I had a case not too long ago that received an RFE and nobody received it by mail, and we didn't get any email notification, although I'd signed up for them, that one had been issued. Luckily, I just happened to uh, have another case I was checking into, and that one had been taking a long time, and they said, oh, uh, when I called in, we issued an RFE on that case. Well, you know, that we had to scramble to meet the deadline at that point, uh, but so, it, you know, make sure that you're getting your mail at your correct address, because if you miss that, that's, we get a lot of calls from people that, well, I missed a request for evidence and I didn't respond. Um, and now my case was denied. How do I reopen it? In some cases, you may be out of time. So, yeah, very important to pay attention to those and, rep and reply in a timely manner. And the typical notices you get from USCIS are on a, a white paper. These ones typically come on colored paper. So you will know when they arrive that um, they want a request from you. They want more information. So reply in a timely manner. And if at that point you see you have a concern, a lot of the times if you're doing it on your own, this is when somebody will say, I need some need some help. And they'll call up a, an immigration lawyer to help them with that request for evidence to respond accordingly. We see a lot of issues with financial uh, support documents as well here uh, where True. people don't understand the financial requirements uh, because it goes off of dependents and there's other factors that are involved whether you're using assets, whether you're using income, uh, a lot goes into those affidavits of support. So we see a lot of requests for evidence on those as well. And you don't have to file your medical when you file your initial application either. So if you filed your application without your medical, at this point, they could request your medical too. And they'll tell you uh, that you could bring that with you to your interview. Sometimes they have you mail it in as well. Depends. Yeah, they call that a deficiency notice, that your your case was a little deficient. And what they'll do is they'll just tell you to bring it to your interview with you. So it's not something you need to rush and get done and get in by a deadline. Just put it on your to-do list before you go to your interview that you need to bring it with you. And because medicals expire, we typically don't, when we file cases for our clients, we don't include the medical in the initial filing. We wait until we get that deficiency notice or the interview is scheduled before we tell our clients to go get that medical. And then, like Christine said, take it to the interview with you. And that can only be done by uh, what's called a civil surgeon, too. They're, they are medical professionals that are designated by USCIS uh, to do these medical. So you can't just go to any physician to do it. It has to be a civil surgeon. So if, you've, if you do get a request for evidence, a notice of intent to deny, a deficiency notice, it's important to comply with that as soon as you possibly can. If USCIS is satisfied at that point, then what they will do is they will schedule you for your final interview. Well, it, first, the, in the background, they'll run the background checks once they have the biometrics. So that's another thing that's going on that you don't really know about, but they're running background checks on you. They're running you through Interpol and all kinds of international databases to see if you have a criminal history. So um, you you may or may not hear about that down the road, but that's what's going on. And that's why then that's a difference between filing with USCIS through adjustment while you're in the US and filing maybe through a consulate. Because if you file through a consulate, you actually have to submit your police records, your police checks with your documentation. But in the US, that's what your biometrics is, right? They do that background check here. Um, interview. So if you pass all of that, everything looks in order. They'll finally schedule for an interview and the interview will be based on your location. So it'll be the closest USCIS, uh, 
office, field office to, to where you live. So if you live anywhere in the Buffalo area, even from Erie, Erie, Pennsylvania, out to Rochester, Niagara Falls, all of those cases are processed here in the city of Buffalo. You'll receive an interview notice, and that interview notice will detail everything that you need to bring to your interview. And all interviews based on marriage, all, all cases based on marriage, require an interview with USCIS every time. So you, you should expect to have that interview, and you and your spouse must be present at the interview. If your spouse does not show up to the interview, then they could deny your case just for the simple fact that your spouse did not show up to the interview. You can reschedule interviews if there is a conflict, but again, it's like a biometrics notice. You'll get a random date on reschedule. Best case scenario, or it's best to show up to that interview when scheduled. So they'll go through that interview. At the end of the interview, then they will typically make a decision. Uh, every officer is different, even here in Buffalo. We have some officers that will, at the end of the interview, they say, okay, everything looks good. I'm going to approve you. You will receive your, your card in the next seven days. Same office. You could get an officer in Buffalo that says, okay, I need to review this further. I'll let you know within 30 days. So every officer is a little bit different on how they conclude that I interview. I think every case is different too. So, yes, uh, you know, if you have maybe a, just one issue in your case that they want to check into, they won't be able to approve you that day. They may need. And here again, they could do another request for evidence. They could do a notice sure, of intent and deny. Things come up at the interview. They ask questions. It leads to a need for more information on that topic. And then they can do issue another request for evidence asking for more information. Yep. So they could, they could approve your case. They could request more information or they could even deny your case. Um, and typically with a, a request for information or a notice of intent to deny or denial, you'd get that by mail. Uh, I haven't seen many officers in the interview say, I'm denying your case and say denied. No, they typically will give you yeah, an opportunity you to respond. Um, and typically a notice like that will arrive somewhere within 30 days after your interview you should expect uh, either your approval notice or your green card to arrive by mail or a request for additional information uh, from USCIS. Thank you for joining us today. If you haven't already, please subscribe where you listen to your favorite podcasts. Give us a thumbs up and a five-star rating. And most importantly, tune in next time to the Arrive podcast, the U.S. Immigration Law Podcast for Canadians.